Jai Sri Radhe, Jai Gurudev. <coughs> On the instruction of our dear Gurudev and with his mercy, we continue our reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, Chapter 4, by Krishna Daskare Kaviraj Goswami, and in the translation from Bengali, and with the commentary by Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. <clears throat> I see Ananda Prem, but I don't see a translation for her. There it comes. Thank you very much. Ananda Prem Ki Jai. Um, we've now, in, we're in our third week of reading uh, chapter four of the Adilila. And to give some reminder of our starting point and the background, well, the starting point is Gurudev's mercy. And the background is that uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita is a biography, but a very special kind of biography. It's a spiritual biography. So in part, it's the biography of a, a man in material terms, a man who appeared, lived, and then left his body, a jiva, a soul. But then also, secondly, it's the history of a soul and the evolution of a soul and the absolutely miraculous experience that this soul had. And uh, it's a little bit trivial, but it's nice to remind you again that this is not like a uh, a scripture, this book. This is really a biography in the modern sense, that it's based on writings and notes and research. And in that sense, it's very, yeah, it's very modern, like I say. Um, it has three parts, you might remember, corresponding to the three parts of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's life. The Adi Lila, which we're reading, is about the early part of his life until about age 24. The Madhya Lila is about the middle time after he takes sannyas. And then the Antya Lila is mostly about when he's retired to Puri and living uh, there with his close associates. And as we see, as we read the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's very strongly connected to two other important works, the Bhagavad Gita and the, and the um, Srimad Bhagavatam. Adi Lila chapter 4 teaches about the confidential reasons for the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And by, by confidential, we mean not that it's top secret, like a, a, a spy story, but that it comes from the most intimate parts of his heart. Confidential means what were the, what were the feelings, what were the movements of his heart and his soul that made him want to appear? What are the reasons known only to the heart? This is very important all the way through our reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita. That understanding the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, or Mahaprabhu is only possible by understanding the heart of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The reasons are only known in his heart. The reasons can only be realized, only be felt through the heart, through the soul. So as much as we read the words, and as much as I explain and talk with words, we need to find a place in our feeling, in our hearts and souls, 
that harmonizes with the vibration of the heart and soul of Chaitanya in order to understand. And that is one way of defining, describing the Bhakti Yoga Marg, the path of Bhakti, penetrating into ourselves, into our own souls, into our own Svarup, we will understand more and more clearly the soul of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and therefore fully understand the reasons why he took um, took a body, took uh, made his appearance. Because once we've fully entered into our own Svarup, into our own spiritual identity, we will have all the tools we need to understand and to experience Prema Bhakti. That is the, the, the practice of devotional service to God. So they go together. The more we follow our Bhakti path, the more we do our sadhana, our practice, the closer we come to ourselves, and the more deeply we will understand why God has chosen this path for us. So there are two things that are happening at the same time. I remember once Gurudev drawing two lines on a paper. They're going in parallel. They're going together. We learn more about ourselves and we learn more about God. They're part of the, the two sides of the same spiritual experience. <clears throat> And then finally, as a kind of reminder of the uh, background, it's hard to underline too much what a remarkable um, phenomenon, event, what a remarkable event Mahaprabhu's life was, what a kind of crisis it was for him in all the positive sense of the word, a shock discovering that he was an incarnation of Krishna. And then in his interior life, in his spiritual consciousness, watching and experiencing Krishna as Radha and Mohan carrying out loving pastimes. So Chaitanya appeared in one body, but with two spiritual positions. One of the beloved, Mohan, the other, the lover, Radha, so that he for once could understand how it feels to be a devotee of God, to love God, to relish that, and to understand the position that someone who loves God is in. And, and as we know, the highest lover of God, this is Radharani. So these are the so-called internal reasons, the reasons that come from his heart, the reasons that can't be explained but can only be meditated upon and, and realized through deepening our understanding of our own selves. Because as, as we learn, the deeper we go into ourselves, the more we understand the relation between Radha and Mohan, the many different qualities of that love, the many different qualities of that relationship, that's exactly what is going on in the heart of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu during his life. So the more we dive deep into our own hearts, the more we dive deep into the heart of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, last time we read the together the short introduction by Srila Prabhupada of uh, chapter 4. I repeat that the introduction to the entire uh, the entire Adilila is much longer and is very, very good and very, very helpful. So I can recommend you reading that. But in this introduction then, Prabhupada very very quickly, very briefly explains the three internal, the, the three spiritual, the three heartfelt reasons 
why Krishna came to this earth in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And I just said them, but I said them again, that was to relish the point of view of Radha, what she sees, what she feels, to understand the the mellow of someone who enjoys him, and then to understand the kind of bliss, the kind of pleasure that she experiences. And what's very special, it's the last word on this point, but what's very, very important is that our sweet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is experiencing these things, these two positions at once. The position of Mohan and the position of Radha. The position of the beloved and the position of the lover. The position of the um, enjoyer and the position of the enjoyer of the enjoyer. And I try to repeat this because in my own feelings, in my own heart, I, I, I struggle to understand what that might have feel, felt like, what it could feel like to be these two things at the same time. And we know from stories about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that it had very strange effects on his body. The first is that he shines a golden effulgence, golden shine, but also there are other physical symptoms that he has which come from the fact that he is two persons at once, both beloved and, and lover. And that somehow his life means, his life embodies the, the connection between the two, the flow between lover and love, beloved. This links, just a last note, this links to a very sweet uh, exchange we've had recent this week in the morning class in Radha, about Radha Rasa Sudaniti, I think verse 129, where there are two kinds of ecstasy, there are two kinds of extreme pleasure. One is of being in union with the lover, so the union of Radha and Mohan, and the other is the ecstasy of being in separation, Radha and Mohan being separated from each other. And there's one being who can feel this, and who does feel this, and even in a living uh, uh, material existence, and that's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he feels this loving relation within him, both in terms of the ecstasy of union and the ecstasy of separation. Last week we read verses 17 to 22. The verses in Chaitanya Charitamrita are are shorter and the commentaries are often shorter, not always. So they go a bit more quickly. In verse 17, Krishna began to speak. Or perhaps we could, we could say that Krishna Das Kaviraj put into words what he felt Krishna was thinking. But in any case, it was a very beautiful message. Krishna talked about what it was that does not make him happy. And let's think already the fact that um, God himself is telling to all the devotees of the world that he's not happy. What makes him happy? What makes him not happy? So he doesn't act like a king or an almighty God at all. He acts like someone talking to a friend. We'll come back to this theme today. But he talks like someone who wants us to know how he feels, wants to know what he's missing and what he's longing for. Anyway, what, the, what he said in verse 17 was, well, what I don't like is majesty. I'm not happy when people treat me like a king. He said, and the words he used in verse 17 were, love is weakened by majesty. If you treat Krishna like a king, then your love for him is imperfect. It's weak. In verse 18, then, he describes, Krishna describes for us how to become a servant. Uh, sorry, how he can become a servant. How Krishna himself can become a servant. And he says it's not by treating him like a god, not uh, like a king, but it's by understanding, realizing, that the highest power in the world is not the king, but rather love. 
And by that, he means not love as an idea, but being in love. So it, Krishna says, if you want to be greater than me, if you want me to be your servant, all you have to do is realize that above all gods, above all kings, is the power of loving. And it's not said in this verse, but you and I know the name of this power of loving. It's Radharani. In verse 19, Krishna reminded us about a familiar idea that he gives back to his devotees the love that his devotees give to him. So he says, love is an exchange. Love is, uh, the word in the translation was reciprocal, giving back what I receive. And once again, it's so important to understand that love is not meant as an idea, but as an action. Love is not what we call in grammar, a, a, what do you call that in grammar? A, sub, a, a noun, a substantive. Love is a verb. Love means to love, loving. Because if we understand love is just a far away, perfect idea, it will never enter our lives. We must understand the word love everywhere in all the scriptures of bhakti as the verb love. Love as an action. Jai Gurudev, do you want to share? Very good. Okay. Radhe, Radhe. Sorry, I thought I heard you starting to say so. Uh, in verse 20, then, um, there was a verse from Bhagavad Gita saying kind of the same about the devotees. I give back to my devotees what they give to me. And then finally, we had this double verse last week, 21 22, um, which is more on the same theme, said that Krishna will become the subordinate, that means the servant, to anyone who practices loving devotion, anyone who practices bhakti. And then secondly, it says, anybody who treats Krishna like a king will not receive, will not receive uh, love back. So now today we continue with verse 23, and this verse in some ways continues this, this thought about what it is to have a, a, a relationship of devotion to Krishna. And what we'll try to do is um, connect that to the, the meaning of the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So verse 23, Krishna is still speaking. Actually, he's going to be speaking now for 12 more verses. Or maybe he's thinking. We don't know what um, Krishna Das Kaviraj is, uh, his intention is. It's more like we listen in on Krishna's meditation which is, it's so sweet, I, I repeat myself a bit, that just the fact that we have a book here, which is giving us the, the thoughts of God, is so, is so intimate and so sweet and so beautiful. Nitadaya, <laughs> your Nitadaya, your beautiful uh, bhajan is coming through to everyone. I, I, I'm very sorry to stop it. It's very nice, but difficult to hear. So we're in the we're in the mind and the thoughts and the heart of of God Himself, which is just a, such a intimate and 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 sweet uh, position to be in. And then we can ask, well, if Krishna Das Kaviraj is giving us Krishna's thoughts, who, who is Krishna thinking to or talking to? To you, to me, to all jivas, past and present and future, to the universe? Krishna is sharing his feelings with the universe. It's so generous. It's so uh, merciful. What kind of God acts this way? A God who is only interested in a devotional relationship with his devotees. 
So when, when he said in verse 17 that I just reminded you, I don't care about majesty, we can really wonder what kind of God is that? It's a God of love. So he's telling us in these, in these verses how, how to receive the love. And by that, again, I remind you it's a love is an action. So it's how to become involved in loving God, how to become involved in devotional service, how to become involved in, in service in general. It's just not the way a king thinks, is it? It's not the way an Abrahamic God from Christianity or Islam or Judaism would think. The question of Jesus is another matter. He's thinking very much this way. So now to explain this in verse 23, uh, Krishna is going to speak about his relation to the gopis during the Rasa Lila. And actually, he's, uh, Krishna Das Kaviraj is quoting a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam in the 10th canto. And here's the verse. Mai bhaktir hi bhutanam amritat vya kalpate dishya yad asin bat sneo bhav bhavatinam madapana. And Prabhupada translates this way. Devotional service rendered to me by the living beings revives their eternal life. O oh, my dear damsels of Vrat, your affection for me is your good fortune, for it is the only means by which you have obtained my favor. It's actually interesting. I went and back and checked the the Bhagavatam, and the translation is slightly different. So you you know that the Bhagavatam translation and this translation were done at different times and and by different people. Some of some of his uh, Prabhupada's assistants were helping him with translation, but that's another matter. So I repeat: devotional service, bhakti. Render to me, mai, so bhakti, mai, mai, mai bhakti, devotion to me, by the living beings, the bhutattaram, this revives, or actually the word is kalpate, that means he leads them to eternal life. Oh, my dear damsas of Raj, your affection for me, mat sneho, for me, affection, is your good fortune for it is the only means by which you have obtained my favor. So Krishna wants to say, or Krishna Das Kaviraj wants to say, or show how the Virajvasis are models of devotion, models of devotional service. And so he comments like this, Prabhupada now, Pure devotional service is represented in the activities of the residents of Rajabhumi, Vrindavan. And now, Srila Prabhupada continues and gives some background for this, this verse from Bhagavatam. He says, During a solar eclipse, the Lord came from Dvaraka and met with the inhabitants of Vrindavan at Samantha. Panchaka. So it's a, it's a, it's a famous story where Krishna is coming together with his families, his associates, his friends, and the gopis are there too, or at least they're on the side of the action. And they're suffering, the gopis. They don't understand why he's not with them. They've given all their love to him. They've, they've been loyal to him. They've been good to him, kind to him. And also, it's interesting, it's important that many commentators of this verse say that Radha is there too, among the gopis, but it's not said in the verse. So now Prabhupada continues, the meeting was intensely painful for the damsels of Vrajmumi, because Lord Krishna had apparently left them to reside at Dvarka. So the gopis were all thinking that he had left them behind. 
And part of their sadness, maybe much of their sadness, is because they don't understand. It's not only that he's gone, it's that they don't understand why he's gone. They don't understand what Krishna love is. They understand it as him giving, they give love to him and why, and then he should be a friend. But he's left them. Or at least they think he's left them. It's not in the end actually true. But in any case, they're confused about what Krishna's love means. When Krishna loves us, what does that uh, guarantee us? What does that give us? What does that um, make us responsible to do? What is Krishna's love? They don't know. They don't know why he loves. They don't know how he loves. They don't know why he travels to, to other places when he's together with them. And I talk a lot about this now because that's exactly the question that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu answers. How does Krishna love? The gopis cannot understand it. They don't get it. They say, what? We were nice to you. Why do you leave? But Lord Chaitanya is going to appear in such a special way and teach us what divine love is. Teach us what it means to love God and how God loves. Prema Bhakti Yoga. So what we're seeing here in this little story is a kind of invitation to Mahaprabhu. When the gopis are alone with Krishna, they don't understand. They're in gopi bhav, of course. They're in a soul consciousness which does not understand devotional consciousness, manjari bhav. And even so, Krishna cares about them and they love him. It's not fake love. It's real love, but it's not the love that we can understand by the mercy of Mahaprabhu. And this is what Prabhupada explains in some way. He, he says this, The Lord obligingly acknowledged the pure devotional service of the damsels of Raj by speaking this verse. So the message is for the gopis, but actually for all uh, the Brajwasis. I see your love, I see your care, and I want to comfort you and reassure you. It's not I want to love you back equally. It's that I want to make sure you're not hurting. I want to care for you. But this they don't understand. They don't understand the truth about, about Prema Bhakti. They cannot. They don't understand the truth about his love. They don't understand about the experience of Prem. And this is the moment at which the miracle of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu answers the questions. Again, Krishna is very kind to them. He says, your, your care, your worry expresses the perfection of your hearts. And he also says in the verse, you might remember that because you love me purely, you will find liberation. And I will come back. I will come back. Your devotion to me wants me to make, wants, uh, sorry, your devotion to me makes me want to come back, to be with you, to be close to you, and to stay with you. Verse 24 now, the next three verses, 24, 25, 26, they are talking about the different kinds of love that we may have for God the different kinds of loving relationships we can have for God. And for many of you, these, these may be familiar. There, there, are, there, there are three here, but there are five different kinds of bhav as, uh, as presented in um, uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Rupa Goswami. So here's the verse. Matta mora putra bhave karana bandhana atina dhyana kara lalana palana. And Prabhupada translates, Mother sometimes binds me as her son. She nourishes and protects me, thinking me utterly helpless. Mother, Mata, sometimes binds me, Bandana, as her son. It says, uh, put, Putra Bhava, in the mood of a son. Putra is son. And Bhav, you know. 
the mood of the sun. So she treats me not physically, materially as a sun, but as someone who has the mood of the sun, who's in a spiritual mood of the sun. She nourishes and protects me, thinking me utterly helpless. So this, you might remember, is called Vatsalyaba, the love of a mother towards her son, or the mood of the relation of the mother towards the son. It's the mood of care and, and protection. It sees uh, helplessness. It sees where help is needed. Uh, this does not mean that it sees a helpless soul, but it means seeing a soul where help is needed for uncovering. It, it sees the mother, the Vatsali above, is the mood of seeing a perfect soul who is materially covered by helplessness. So, the, And the example we talk about often is the Yasoda, Mother Yasoda's love for Krishna. And we can think, we can think back to what we learned in Bhagavad Gita chapter 14 about the Gunas, that all the modes of love have to relate to the attachments to material coverings. Only the the highest mode of love, the Mahabhav, is free of attachments. So when the lover sees the perfect soul with no attachments, with no coverings, that is when the love is the highest. And that is the love that our sweet Radha sees for our sweet Mohan. Verse 25. Sakya Shuda Sakya Kara Skande Arohana Arohana Tummi Kon Badaloka Tummi Ami Samma. Prabhupada translates, My friends climb on my shoulders in pure friendship, saying, What kind of man are you? You and I are equal. My friends, Sakka, climb on my shoulders in pure friendship, Shuddha Sakye, saying, What kind of big man are you? You and I are equal. To me, ami sam. You, me, the same. So this is an expre expression of Sakyabhav, the mood of friendship, love in the mood of friendship. I see you as you see me. And more, I see only as much of you as you see of me. My self-realization is the navigator of my um, go, uh, God realization. So this is the mood of Arjuna in the in at least the early parts of the Bhagavad Gita. There's a friendship, there's a trust, and the more Arjuna understands what Krishna is telling him about his own soul, the more he understands God. Verse twenty six. Priya yadi mana kari kariyai bhat sana veda stuti haite hare saya moramana. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. If my beloved consort reproaches me in a sulky mood, that steals my mind from the reverent hymns of the Vedas. So this is very nice verse. It tells us a hundred things about what we read in the Leelas of the Lapakus Manjari and, and uh, Radha Rasa Sudaniti. If my beloved consort, my Priya, so Priya Yadimana, if she reproaches me, if she criticizes me in a sulky mood, sort of sad and discouraged and a little angry, sulky mood is Manakari, that steals my mind, Moramana, that steals my mind from the reverent hymns of the Vedas. Now, if you're a traditional Vaishnava, you think, oh, that's terrible. I should be concentrating on the reverent hymns of the Vedas. But we bhaktas know that this is just what we need. So even if my lover is being difficult with me, that's actually good because it gets me into my heart and takes my brain away from the rules and regulations of the scriptures and the reverence, the word is reverent, the reverent hymns of the Vedas. 
and therefore I can become more purely in my, I can come more purely in my soul and come more purely in my heart. So this reproaches in a sulky mood, so a sort of grumpy lover. This is exactly the kind of thing we meet often in the Viraj Leelas, in the Leelas of the forest in Vrindavan, where Radha is playfully becoming angry and grumpy and happy and ecstatic and sad and there's all sorts of emotional movements. All of this is to build out, to increase the size of our hearts, to ex increase our emotional experience by showing that this is the emotional experience that God has. You know, it would be so easy to say for Raghunath Goswami or or any other poet to say, well, Radha got up, she felt desire for Mohan, she met him in the forest, and then she went home in the morning. But what the Leelas give us is all sorts of complex details about how they feel. And one of these is this sulky mood. The, the gift of the Leelas is to make us acquainted, make us, help us to understand the shape of the divine soul. Or to say it in a really simple way, when God is having a love affair, what does it feel like? This is, this is what the Leelas are teaching us. Because the love affair between Narada and Mohan is not going on far away on a cloud somewhere. It's going on in our hearts. If we understand how they love, we understand how we love. So this kind of loving relation you might remember is called Madhuri above, the uh, mood of con conjugal love, the mood of feelings between lovers. But also, I, I, I mentioned it, but we can stop a moment. Uh, Prabhupada in his comment is, oh no, not Prabhupada, sorry, Krishna Das Kaviraj in his verse is pointing to this conflict that we often talk about between Vaidhi Bhakti and Raganuga Bhakti. Because if my mind are focused on my on the reverence, on the respectful, dutiful, obeyant hymns, the verses, then I'm in Vaidhi Bhakti. But if my mind and my heart are in my feelings and finding and exploring the nature of divinity there, then I'm in Raghunuga Bhakti. So in this verse, he's saying, it's so nice when my lover is a little bit grumpy with me because then I can get my mind out of the books. It's nice when my lover leads me into my heart, into my Raghunuga spontaneity. And that way I can be free from the Vaidhi Bhakti practice. Now, in the commentary, Prabhupada is going to comment on um, the Upanishads, yes. He says, according to the Upanishads, all living entities are dependent on the supreme living entity, the personality of Godhead. And then he cites the Kata Upanishad, Nityo Nityanam Chetanash Chetanannam Eko Bahunam yo vidati kaman. And then he translates it for us. One eternal living entity supports all the other eternal living entities. And the subject that comes out of this um, verse from Upanishad is that there's a connection, that there's a relation, that bhakti yoga Prema Bhakti Yoga is about relation. And in that relation, there's this, there's support. In that relation between living entities, there's energy. Between souls, between hearts, between minds. So when he says one eternal living entity supports all the other eternal living entities, he's saying that there's relation between living entities, jivas, and that means that there is feeling. The support he's talking about is the energetic connection of love, of feelings. 
Prabhupada continues now and says, because the Supreme Personality of Godhead maintains all the other living entities, they remain subordinate to the Lord. They're lower from the Lord. Even when joined with Him in this reciprocation of loving affairs. So he's saying, since Bhagavan, Krishna is the um, maintainer, then everyone, all the living entities are under him, even if there is a loving relation. But now the important part, Prabhupada explains, is how that Lord, the maintainer, becomes subordinate to the devotees through the loving relation. So how that energy of love is uh, reversed. First, he says, the, the devotees are under the Lord because he maintains everything. And now he's going to say that he is under the devotees because they love him. So he says, now Prabhupada says, but in the course of exchanging transcendental love of the highest purity, sometimes the subordinate devotee, the devotee who's lower, tries to be predominate, so be higher, predominate, over the predominator, tries to be higher than the one who's highest. When we exchange love with God, the devotee becomes higher. Prabhupada again, one who lovingly exchanges with the Supreme Lord as if he were his mother or father, sometimes supersedes the position of the Supreme Personality of God that sometimes goes higher. This is the Vatsali above. Prabhupada continues, similarly, his fiancé or lover sometimes supersedes the position of the Lord. So sometimes the lover goes higher. And this is the case, this is what we'll see later in the, in the appearance of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the relation between Radha and Mohan. But, Prabhupada continues, attempts such attempts are exhibitions of the highest love. This was um, Madhurya Bhav. And then he goes on. Only out of pure love does the subordinate lover, to so the lover who's lower, the subordinate lover of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, chide him. Chide means to tease. So he's, he's referring to this way that <clears throat> the lover... The lover who is not named, but we can think very easily about the Radha. It's only out of pure love that that happens, he says. So anyone who teases Krishna does it out of pure love. And so Prabhupada continues, the Lord enjoying this chiding, this teasing, takes it very nicely. He's happy to be teased. Just like, <clears throat> just like, um, <laughs> I was remembering, in the schoolyard, I'm sure it was, you had this experience, in the schoolyard when I was 10 years old and deeply in love with the love of my life, the 10-year-old girl in my class, and she came and she hit me. And I was very, very happy because I knew that, that she shared my feelings because she hit me. So hitting in, in hitting in the child, uh, in the, in school is a sign of love, just like teasing on the part of the lover is a sign of, of love. And when it's the highest lover that's teasing, I'm thinking of Radha, then it's the highest love that's coming through. And then, and then so Prabhupada says this, the exhibition, the showing of natural love makes such activities very enjoyable. So when we show natural love like that through teasing or through hitting on the schoolyard, then that is very enjoyable. And notice that he uses the word natural love, Prabhupada. It's the love that's pure and authentic and spontaneous. And uh, it feels like he could be thinking it's love from the constitutional position, from Arsvarup. The natural love is the same as the 
love which comes forth in Raganuga Bhakti. It's that love that we see played out in the Vrindavan Lila, played out in the, in the pastimes. When the natural love comes, it's love that's not covered by any material coverings. It's pure love. And it gives us pleasure. No matter what form it takes, if we feel that it's natural, that it's not thought out in the mind, then it gives pleasure. And the name of this pleasure is Ladani. And the energy that carries it from one heart to the next is called Ladani Shakti. And the embodiment of this Ladani Shakti in its purest form is called Radharani. So natural love is in all of us. And in all of us, it's more or less covered, but it's there. This constitutional position is something that everyone shares. And the love that flows through it, something that everyone shares. But all of us suffer from false ego, and we forget about this natural love. We forget about this constitutional position. The more we <clears throat> dive deep into our own swarup, into our own spiritual identity, into our own self, the more we clean away the, the covering and the more the natural love flows. The natural love, the nature of natural love is to flow, is to be given. We don't, we don't put the love that we have in a in a glass jar and close it in a closet in the kitchen. Love is only love if it flows. Love is only love if it flows. So when we talk about our material coverings, about thinking that uh, I'm this body, I'm not the soul, those coverings are blocking the flow. And once we clean them away, almost like a, a dirty water pipe in our house, then the love begins to flow again. And when it's flowing perfectly, it's because Radharani is there. Because Ladani, pleasure, bliss is flowing perfectly. When it's flowing perfectly, then there's no energy wasted. There's no energy that's blocked. So all the loving energy inside of us, seeking to get out, can flow. And so this Ladani Shakti that it represents is at its top, at its maximum. Now Prabhupada goes back to this question of Vaidhi Bhakti to talk about exactly this point. He says, In worship of the Supreme Lord, with veneration, meaning with respect and f fear and following the rules, in worship of the Supreme Lord with veneration, there is no manifestation of such natural love because the devotee considers the Lord his superior. So if we have to look up with fear and respect to the Lord, then our love cannot flow properly to him. It's only by looking at the Lord as a friend, as a personality, that our love can um, flow correctly. So veneration is the word for Vaidhi Bhakti. There are lots of words for Vaidhi Bhakti. Reverence, glorification, uh, respect. They're all names of a relation to God based on, on uh, fear, where no natural love is shown or natural love is blocked, where we don't see our constitutional position, our, our home base, which is the soul. It's blocked. It cannot come out. It cannot emerge like a like a pipe in the plumbing of your house that's blocked. <clears throat> All that natural energy in there is, is blocked. <clears throat> the problem is, the problem with, or well, maybe I don't want to say problem, but the challenge with the Raganuga Bhakti is that we cannot demand that our natural love flows. We cannot turn on a switch, click, to make our natural love flow. We cannot use our, our minds, our willpower to make natural love flow. If we do, 
if we can make love flow because our brains want it, then it's not love. If we can go on <clears throat> Amazon and click on the love button and pay the love fee, which must be very high, then it's not love. This is why we use the word spontaneous when we're talking about bhakti. The experience of love in bhakti, in Raganuga bhakti, is spontaneous. And that is, it's a wonderful world, word, it's kind of a difficult word, but it's a wonderful word that means you don't know when it's coming, you don't know how it's coming, where it's coming, you can do nothing to get it, it's a complete surprise. In English, when we say a person is spontaneous, we mean we don't know what they're going to say or do. So spontaneous love is love you cannot order on Amazon. You cannot buy it. You cannot take it. You cannot demand it. And you can pray for it all you want, but this won't help. It will come when it comes. Otherwise, it's not love. So actually, I have to laugh at myself because I laugh when I'm alone and meditating. And I say, well, the best way to prepare for my uh, bhakti realization is to be completely unprepared. It has to come as a complete surprise. So it's almost like saying only by not doing your homework can you be prepared for class. We have to open our hearts to any possibility. And actually... That's the moment when it'll come. Unpredicted and unpredictable. Just like love. Who fell in love with the one you thought you were going to fall in love with? I was sure the girl on the 10 year, the 10 year old girl in the schoolyard who hit me, that was the love of my life. But no, I was completely surprised, just like you were. You never planned for it. And thank God you never planned for it. Love is spontaneous. Raganuga Bhakti is spontaneous. Prabhupada continues. Regulative principles. So now we're talking about Vaidhi Bhakti, right? Regulative principles in devotional service are meant for those who have not invoked their natural love of Godhead. Invoke, this means haven't switched it on yet, haven't called upon it yet, haven't made it flow yet. So if we haven't made that step to, towards our natural love, opening our hearts, then Vaidhi Bhakti is recommended. It's not a bad thing. It's just not the, the end goal. So for those who have not experienced this spontaneous, natural devotion, which is just about all of us, or at least we have not experienced it purely and perfectly, then Vaidhi Bhakti is recommended. And then Prabhupada says, when natural love arises, all regulative methods are surpassed. So we go farther, we go beyond them. And pure love is exhibited, shown, between the Lord and the devotee. So when it comes, and I repeat, we cannot predict when it comes, then Vaidhi Bhakti is left behind. We don't have to choose to leave it behind. It is simply left behind. So it's not, um, it's not a conflict. It's not a competition between Vaidhi Bhakti and Raganuga Bhakti. Vaidhi Bhakti can lead us, even if it's a bit artificially, to what we already are, which is pure, spontaneous love. And this is where I want to link Prabhupada's commentary to Chaitanya more directly. And that'll be the last bit we talk about today. Um, Krishna becomes the lover of God in the appearance of Chaitanya. Krishna says, I want to know what it feels like to be the lover of God. I know everything else. I feel everything else. I've done everything else. But there's one thing I have not felt and experienced, and that is to be the lover, the lover of God. Obviously, you can't be, if you're a mortal, you cannot be the lover of yourself. 
But Krishna can do this, and he did it in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he became the lover of God in the mood of Radha. He did it so he could experience that, but he also did it in order to share with us uh, Ujvala Prema Rasa, the highest, the highest mood or mellow or feeling or taste of love of the divine. This is the subject of chapter three, which we have not read yet. But not only did he want to feel that, he wanted to give a gift to Jivas. And that gift was the highest form of love for God. Or we say sometimes to distribute prema bhakti, to distribute the devotional love of God. And it's usually called, it has many names, but it's usually called unnato jvalaras. Unata means highest. Ujvala means uh, shining like the sun. And Ras, of course, you, you know, means divine love. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave us Unato Jvala Ras, the highest shining divine love. This is important for our practice, for our bhakti pra- practice. We say that Chaitanya brought this kind of Ras, Unato Jvala Ras, this highest shining Ras which is the cause of manjari bhav. This highest emotion causes the mood of the manjaris. How is that? Well, we can explain this by going back to this idea about love and, and the idea that love is not a thing. It's an action. Love is not something you put in a box. Love is not something you put in a pot. So when we say that Lord Chaitanya gave us this highest form of love, he doesn't mean he put it in a cave somewhere in the in the West Bengal, and we can all go visit it sometimes when we like. He doesn't mean he put it in a box and sent it to Vrindavan. He means he gave an understanding about what it is to love, to love, to be a lover. He gave an understanding about the experience of love. He gave us an understanding that love is not something you put in a box. It's not an idea. It's not a concept. It's a way of being. It's an act. It's an action. He gave us not a thing. He gave us knowledge about what happens when God... uh, when God is the lover, Radha, and at the same time, the beloved Mohan. That's what he gave us. And he gave it to us in his own existence, because he was both. In his spiritual consciousness, that love affair was going on. God as the lover, Radha, and God as the beloved Mohan. And then by teaching about this spiritual consciousness to the Goswamis, who could write the beautiful poetry and books about the Vraj Lila, he could share it with us. And what did he share again? Not love, but understanding of loving. Manjaris are not servants of Krishna, this we know. But they are also not servants of Radha. Be careful. They are servants of Radha's love for Mohan. They are servants of Radha's love. They are servants of what Radha wants and desires. We don't need another queen to replace the king. We want to serve divine love. And Radha is the divine lover. So we want to serve her, not venerate her. And Manjari Bhav is the mood of that service. Manjari Bhav is what we call serving the love of Radha for Mohan. It's not the mood of the lovers. It's not the mood of the love itself. It's the mood of wanting that ha- to happen. Wanting the love to happen between Radha and Mohan. We call the Yuga Lakishwar. It's the mood of wanting love to happen at the highest level. That is what Manjari Bhav is. It's not 
I want to put the toenail lock on the Radha's toes, just like that. It's I want to do that so that the love, will, the loving affair will be stronger and better and greater. It's not that I want to fan Radha just for fanning Radha. It's that I want to fan her so that she can be prepared to go deeper into the loving relation. Manjari Bhav is the mood of wanting love to happen at the highest level, which means love between Radha and Mohan. It's wanting Radha's love for Mohan to be realized. It means serving the lover and the highest lover in our world, in the, in the world, in the universe. This is our dear Radha. Radha's, the meaning of her life is to love Mohan, and the meaning of our lives is to serve her loving Mohan. And this is, from a certain point of view, very simple, because Radha is the model for any love we ever feel in all our lives. So any love I feel for my daughter or for my mother or for my cat is a tiny drop of that love that Radha feels for Mohan. So by increasing our love in our lives, we are increasing that drop into two drops and three and four. And soon it's a cup and then soon it's more. And all this placed at the feet of Radha. This is why we do service. This is what we mean by devotion. It's making love flow in our lives, everywhere in our lives, on all levels, everywhere we can, everywhere we can make others feel pleasure. What happens when we make someone happy? Let's put it, let's translate that into bhakti words. Making someone happy, your mother or your boss or your teacher, that means that the male enjoyer becomes the female enjoyer of the enjoyment. Sorry, Ananda Prem. <laughs> it means that we take pleasure from the other taking pleasure. This is Manjari Bhav in, in everyday words. Krishna became the servant of the one who loved him. The enjoyer became the servant of the giver of enjoyment. He Become this, became the servant of Radha because Radha knows how to please him. Radha knows what makes him happy. And Krishna is the servant of all devotees who know how to make others happy. That's on the low everyday level. And on the highest level, this is the meaning of the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Krishna put into a position where he can serve the one who gives him happiness. He takes the position of Radha, the one who can give him happiness, and he enjoys her giving him happiness. Now we're just finishing with Prabhupada, the commentary. He says, a devotee who is actually free from all designations due to complete attachment in love, to a devotee who is free from all rules because she is attached in love for, for the Supreme, this devotee exhibits spontaneous love for Godhead, which is always superior to the devotion of regulative principles. And now to conclude this commentary, there comes kind of a change of subject for, for, for Srila Prabhupada, a very sweet change of subject. He says, the informal language used between lover and beloved is indicative of pure affection. So nice. Just think about the way lovers speak to one another when they're alone. The very gentle and sweet and playful and light and trusting and loyal language. So natural, so spontaneous, so pure. Just, would you like a cup of coffee, dear? Completely no fear. No fear, no doubt, no question. But what my lover wants, I want, and what I want, my lover wants. And the kind of language that creates, it's so light and delicious. Now, Prabhupada, to, to finish, when devotees worship their beloved, 
as the most venerable object, spontaneous loving sentiments are observed to be lacking. So if I ask you for a cup of coffee and you have to say, yes, sir, right away, sir, like you were in the army, then the sentiments of love will, of course, not be there. Prabhupada goes on, a neophyte devotee who follows the Vedic instructions that regulate those who lack pure love of Godhead may superficially seem more exalted, higher, than a devotee in spontaneous love of Godhead. In other words, if somebody's in Vaidhi Bhakti, then they may seem higher than someone who's in Raganuga Bhakti. But, Prabhupada says, in fact, such spontaneous, pure love is far superior to regulated devotional service. Such pure love of Godhead is always glorious in all its respects, more so than reverential devotional service rendered by a less affectionate devotee. And I can't think of any better way to f complete this commentary of the verse 26, chapter 4, Taitanya, Taritamita Adilila, than that. So we'll stop here. Yeah, very nice. Very good. Jai Gurudev. Yeah, Jai Jai Shiran. Yeah. Easy to understand. Ah, oh, that's the goal. Yeah. Jai Jai Shirade, Jai Jai Shirade, Jai Jai Shirade. Thank you, everyone.